Now, don't forget, we're doing a live client-only event in mid-October 2022. I'll be speaking. Ryan Griggs will be speaking. Dr. Paul Cleveland will be speaking. Our whole team will be there. You're going to have the opportunity to meet all of us, and you'll have the opportunity to meet other people, individuals that are practicing the infinite banking concept from all over the country. Iron sharpens iron, so you should be there. It'll be worth it. Look forward to meeting you. Look forward to seeing you. Be there. Be square. In this episode, my friend Ev Samblowski sits down with me, and we cover his history of uh, being a physician, a real estate investor, to a life insurance agent. He's still a physician um, in his experience with the infinite banking concept. We cover a lot of ground and had fun doing so. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Bank of a Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. You know, and as always, I'm excited when people, clients, friends uh, come into the studio to record live. But today is, you know, uh, really special. So today I have my friend, Eb Samlowski, with me. And in just the other day, I'm in the pool. This is earlier this week. I know Eb's going to be here. We're recording on a Friday. And uh, I'm just going back in my memory, making notes, when we met, how we met, all that we've done over the years together and individually, independently. And uh, and I was quite touched by going through that. Um, so I'm very glad that he's here. I mean, this, is, this will be a, an episode that you'll want to listen to more than once, I believe. Um, so Eb, Samlow, Eb Samlowski is a formerly board-certified general physician, studied under Dr. DeBakey at the Bentov Hospital in Houston. He's um, a substantial real estate investor, you know, sought after in the real estate world as a speaker, you know, back in the day and currently. Um, and, and as I recall, you know, we were going back to 2009, 2010. I hosted Nelson one to three times a year back then. And uh, Eb came to an event, you know, uh, and he has his own story about that. Uh, Then he kept coming to events, and then he came to events that I was speaking at at different places. And then, um, you know, he became a client right away. You know, uh, he he heard the message and put it into action. Okay, Um, then we then we started talking even together at different real estate and medical events you know around texas and even other states um he became a licensed agent and he uh did that for several years he still practices medicine and all of the other things that he does and it's and it's a lot um you know he he went to a couple of think tanks back in the day prior to the nelson nash institute nelson hosted a think tank annually you went to a couple of those. I know you became great friends with Nelson Nash himself. Um, you know, and, it, and, and really toward the uh, latter years of me hosting Nelson all the way up through 2017. And yeah, 2017. I really appreciated, you know, Ed being in the room just as, as a doctor. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> um it, and I probably left some stuff out, but over this time period, you know, we've become really good friends, and uh, and I'm just excited that you're here, Ev. I'm sure I left something out. You know, I'm not doing justice to his bio, but he's, you know, doesn't have a big overblown ego either. So, um, welcome, Ev. Thank you, and I. I have to reiterate the same thing. James is a dear friend of mine, as was Nelson Nash. I was blessed to get to know Nelson, and actually I got to be with him three months before his death. So even in his later years, he was already thinking about the next book project. So he was just an incredible man. Uh, So I've just been blessed with this relationship with James, his office staff, as well as Nelson and his family. So I'm just grateful to be here. My story starts somewhere around 2007, 2006. I was a board certified surgeon. I was a busy surgeon. And I had a captive audience in in the OR crew. So I used to listen to a lot of... uh, motivational tapes in the OR, Zig Ziglar, Dennis Waitley, Jim Rohn, all of his famous speakers. And 
literally one day, and I believe it was 2007, one of the nurses hands me this book and tells me, what do you think about this? And I looked at the book and I said, okay, I'll read it. So it's Nelson Nash's book, Become Your Own Banker. And I take it home and I read it and I go, this is life insurance. It's whole life insurance. It's the worst place you can put your money. I was taught my entire life, buy term, invest the difference, never, ever, ever buy whole life insurance. So I came back to the OR and was going to give the book back to this nurse. And she said, I don't have any use for it. So I kept it. Well, within a matter of years, my hip went back bad and I needed to have a hip replacement and the book was on the bookshelf and while I was recovering I, I was reading a lot I said you know I need to read this book a second time so I read it the second time and you talk about a life changing event I was hit over the head by a 2 by 4 I said you idiot you totally missed the concept so looking at the back cover I knew Nelson had to be up in age. So I wondered if he was even still alive. So I got online, and literally, this is a God thing. Within a couple of weeks, he was speaking in Fort Worth, sponsored by James Nethery. So I immediately signed up, went to the meeting. I was blown away by Nelson, and I called my wife from the meeting and said, you need to listen to him. And within a couple of weeks, um, he was speaking in uh, Waco, Texas. So we went down there, and she was blown away. So immediately, we started policies. And like James said, the first policy was too small. And I, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he kept expanding. You know, uh, I rapidly that. expanded to multiple policies, and they kept getting bigger. And... You know, Ed, that's that's interesting because, you know, and there's a lot of books here, right? And they're all, you know, we'll talk about most of them or all of them. But Nelson was recovering and he was looking at his bookshelf and he sees the world in the grip of an idea, big old tome, epitome, you know, and he takes it down and 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 rereads it. And then he goes to Dr. Paul Cleveland, whom you know, mm -hmm. and uh, said, you know, you should redo this. I mean, isn't that interesting? To me, it's interesting. Here you're in the OR, and that one nurse is practices the independent banking concept to this day. Um, but she it's like, became my first client. <laughs> did she? Right. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, you. The book almost had your undivided attention. Oh yeah. You know, as opposed to being a busy, sir. I mean, a board certified general surgeon. I mean, it's like no telling what walks in the ER, and you've got to repair it, and you're running the. OR and all the things that you do as a busy physician and there and then there you are recovering I mean you're undivided attention like I said you know I, yeah that's very interesting I mean I'm a lifelong learner I read a tremendous amount and and I listen to a, literally thousands and thousands of tapes so it's like I said, Nelson changed my life. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, buts. And he'll change my kids' lives. I mean, and hopefully he'll go beyond that. One of the things that I talked to Nelson about before his death, you know, I asked him personally, you know, I said, did everybody in your family get it? <laughs> and he said, yes, my kids got it. But some of the grandkids have an entitlement mentality and he's not sure, so sure that they get it. And I, that's one of the reasons I'm in the process of writing a second book. I wrote a chapter for a first book. And it's the book is to make sure that my kids, grandkids, and future generations understand my thought processes. Because there's one family in the world that's maintained their wealth through about 500, 600 years now, and that's the Rothsteins, uh, Rothschild, sorry. And you don't marry into that family unless you study banking and finance. So I want to, I want some kid 
that's re- a relative of mine, you know, four or five generations from now, looking back and saying, you know, that Eb Samlowski must have been some cool dude. That he, <laughs> he got this concept and... Well, some will and some won't. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, sure. with the, this book that I'm writing, that they'll at least understand the fundamentals. More so, you know, Nelson's book was great, but he didn't go into detail on how to implement it and how to use it. Well, he and, gave examples there, but he didn't say, this is how you do it. Yeah, you know, this, that, this is what these individuals are doing. And that's what I'm writing is a specific what I did and why I did it. Mm-hmm. And, and and it'll be available to just about anybody once I get it published. So, Well, I know at that time, uh, and I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but you were – you were a substantial real estate investor, and and maybe you still are, but um, you very much understood cash flows, leverage, right. and financing. Um, yeah, so. it's it's one of those things that we we did a lot of real estate, and I still have real estate holdings. But the amazing thing is, you get older. I'm more interested in passive income. Mm-hmm. You mean or properties you don't have to manage and tenants yeah. you don't have to manage? Huh. And one of the passive things that I'm more interested in, and we did this together, um, there's a brilliant guy by the name of Henry Dvorkin that we actually bought a policy on an older gentleman together with him. And... We didn't have to clean toilets. We didn't have to do anything. And that happened to be a universal life policy. Yeah. This guy kept living. And God bless him. And and I think that was uh, the proper way to do that, what we did. Yeah, so, it, was, it wasn't It was the best policy, but our return was still decent. So one of the things that I, I like to do is buy, you know, Ramsey keeps telling people to sell their policies. <laughs> I'm interested in buying those policies. Well, let me say this. Whenever, if you, look, life insurance is a private asset, right? The owner has all the rights and privileges that an owner would have of any other private property because life insurance is private property. And if you are the insured or the owner of a policy and you sell that policy on the tertiary market, right? Um, And some people are willing to buy it. I mean, I'm a buyer. It does not benefit the seller of that policy because the life insurance industry looks at that as if you're selling your mortality. And to buy life insurance, you know, you have to be healthy. You got to go to underwriting, but you also have to fill out an application and it's full of disclosures in plain English. And one of the questions is, um, have you ever sold your life insurance policies or do you intend to sell this policy? And it's a pretty hard no on underwriting. You might get some jank life insurance company to issue that policy. But selling your policy on the third party or on the tertiary market to a third party when there's no insurable interest, um, it's frowned upon in the life insurance industry. Yeah. So, I mean, full disclosure there. Absolutely. and But at the same time, Ramsey's talking these people into giving up policies, whole life policies that are... Oh, get rid of them quick as possible. Yeah, oh. yeah. Well, in that particular case, in the Borkin, it was his friend that had a policy. He didn't want it. He was going to surrender yeah. it anyway. And then the Borkin's like, well, you know, we can maybe do something better. So the man actually received more than he had in oh, yeah. surrender value. And we even left his family as partial beneficiary for an extended time period i mean i don't remember all the details um if somebody tells you to sell their life insurance policy i mean you should you should understand fully what you have and so i granted now some may not be worth keeping but when it comes to dividend paying whole life insurance issued by a mutual company um i'm a flat buyer i'd buy every single policy i can get and the other thing that I learned from Nelson was you can do a business transaction with anybody and <clears throat> as a business partner you now have an insurable interest in them and you may only do that one business deal it may only last a year but you have an insurable interest in them for the rest of their lives so like I said 
you're not cleaning toilets, you're not cleaning houses, you're not dealing with damaged properties. All Insurance, you have to do is, taxes, repairs. All you're doing is paying a premium until they die. And some of these policies that I'm buying now, that I'm interested in buying, it, are for my kids. I'm never going to see the right. end result. But they're going to be passive for them. And my estate, my trust will pay the premiums. And when those people die, there'll be windfalls for my kids. So. And, and two, the third-party purchase of a policy changes the taxation of life insurance, too. Sure. Um, but so what? So they pay a little tax on it. So what? <laughs> what else are you going to buy that you're not going to pay taxes on? That's right. All right. Yeah, I mean to throw you off. I'm just no, like, throwing fine. out full disclosures there. No, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I'm interested in is, you know, I have, I don't, like I said, I'm looking for passive income. So I'd rather lend money to people at this point. And as I lend it, one of the stipulations of lending it is that I take out a whole life policy on them. And I'll even let them have their family have a partial benefit because the return will be such that I'm going to do fine no matter what. So the, uh, uh, that, I mean, that reminds me when you're talking about real estate and, uh, cause I, I learned a lot about real estate, you yeah. know, a lot of it was because of you participating in a lot of different real estate groups. And, um, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, not the note buyer that's, written a lot of books but you know jackie's mentor that wrote all those books i know <laughs> I'm jack to... jack miller jack miller right um whom he's you know he's graduated you know he was from that uh previous generation um but i i distinctly recall that he said and it resonated with me when i first read it is uh you know through boom bus cycles through booms in the commercial real estate or booms in the you know residential real estate or multifamily or whatever through the booms in the bust and you know the taxation changes and he said the net return is about six percent on real estate yeah. and that'll insult a lot of real estate investors because you know everybody wants to talk about the 20 or 25 or 30 or 50 percent rate of return and i'm not saying those don't exist i'm not but every deal doesn't return 20 percent right because everything doesn't go exactly the way you expect it sometimes um but when i heard that and, and it made sense to me from my experience in real estate. Um, okay, but then you got to deal with the tenants. Oh yeah, and you got to deal with the you know the governmental entities and extracting your private property taxation that changes all the time. I get it. You know, you get to step up in basis. I mean, there's real value in real estate. Um, and I always said that. Look, what is real estate? It's private property. Right, it's a private transaction. It's an appreciating asset. It's a cash flowing asset. And there's a deferred benefit, you know, because we're all going to graduate. You're either going to sell the property in the future or you're going to leave it to your heirs and you get the current step up in basis. But give the IRS enough time and uh, see how long that lasts. I hope it lasts a long time, but no guarantees. You know, those guys up there in Washington and they change their mind all the time. And uh, since they don't have any money, they need your money. Anyway. Well, the nice thing about. Life insurance, though, is it falls under contract law. Mm -hmm. And for the government to mess with contract law, mm -hmm. they just screw up the entire economic system. The Constitution is a contract. So yeah. I don't worry so much about them messing with contract law. Yeah, they've changed the MEC rules. They've changed yeah. some of these rules. But in terms of actually doing away with contracts, I think they're going to have a tough time. Now, real estate, you know, they can change the laws immediately. Like I, right now, this is 2022. In California, it's hard to evict somebody. Oh, wait. You're still, I mean, where? They could be not paying you. You're paying your mortgage, and they're not paying you any rent, and you can't get rid of them. The squatter, yeah. And... So I wouldn't own property in California right now. So mm -hmm. there's life insurance is such an asset that and you get to use it without any issues. I mean, I just went to Saudi Arabia to follow the trail of Moses and I took somebody along with me and it's an expensive trip. I just called the insurance company and said, I need 
multiple thousands of dollars and within a week I actually they this this company actually deposited it directly into my checking account so within uh, I think it was five days I had the money paid for the trip and you making any loan repayments so you can do the yeah. trip again I'll be <laughs> So and that look, so we we had a pool party earlier in the year, and you were telling me about it and showing me all the pictures sure. of this trip. And I knew you were going. You told me about the trip, but now you returned from the trip, and you're showing me all these photos. And I'm like, oh my gosh, following the trail of the the Israelites, you know. And there's kind of, and I don't want to get way off into it, sure. but there's you know one trail that is like, oh no, this is a trail. But then there's the other trail that says, no, that's not the trail. But that's where all the markings, the hieroglyphics, and the the split rock, and you know that Mo- the altar of Moses, and um, I mean it was cool. So I ordered that book, and it was uh, it was the Gold of Exodus. Yep. I ordered that book while we were at the pool party. So it's the next book on my nightstand to read. I'm finishing. Yeah, that it's one. funny how books change your life. I was given that book 30 years ago, and there's, it's written by a guy named Howard Blum, and it's about a guy named Cornuke who actually went over there. And there's all these pictures in the book about Mount Sinai being in Saudi Arabia and the, the golden calf altar and all these things. There's all these pictures in the book. And for years, people said, oh, this is fraudulent. It's not real. Yeah. It doesn't exist. And here I go to Saudi Arabia, and I'm taking identical pictures. I mean, every picture that he took was actually there. So he actually was there 30 years ago. But didn't Saudi Arabia limit uh, tourism for a long yeah, time? Yeah, for period? a number of years. And this is a funny story because... As you can tell, I'm bald. I'm dealing with cancer. I've gone through chemo and radiation. So, and he's winning. Yeah. So right now, uh, several years ago, a friend of mine and I were going to travel to Israel, cross over to Jordan, hire a Bedouin driver, and sneak into Saudi Arabia. And I figured that's a what's, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, what's the worst that could happen? I could get arrested or a shot. I mean, right. so what? <laughs> you could be in prison a long time, right? After you get arrested. So, Ooh. but in the last couple of years, all right, Saudi Arabia's actually open to tourism. They're actually building a city right now called Neom, which is supposed to be four times the size of New York. It's supposed to become the banking and technology center of the world. Most Westerners have never even heard of it. They've just literally, they've got 10,000 guest workers. They're currently building the infrastructure. So they're going to take on Dubai and the Emirates and other countries becoming the world's leader. So they opened up to tourism. And because the Muslims believe in a lot of the Old Testament, they, they have no problem of people going up to Mount Sinai, climbing it, and I was fortunate enough to be able to climb it. And it's a dangerous climb because every year people die on that mountain because it's so the it's a, a, sort of a shale or a loose rock, so it's easy to slip and slide. And it's mm-hmm. easy to fall down. <laughs> but uh, Lord bless me, I didn't have any issues there. But... Uh, it's He's out there hopping sand dunes and all that, right? Your Bedouin yeah. driver lets you drive for a little while. <laughs> yeah, I made friends with this Bedouin. We had some long, intense conversations. And like I said, he took me to sites that most Westerners never see. And that was all the only reason I could do it is because of infinite banking. I mean, I have money in my policies. Um, that's how I pay for my kids' college right now. And that's a funny story. My kids, my son was nine, my daughter was six. And we started their policies back in 2010. And literally, we had to chase my daughter, because these are pretty large policies. We had to chase my daughter around the house and hold her down to get the blood drawn. <laughs> Normally, children don't have to give blood, but these know, are sort of large levels, policies. Did, so. <laughs> yeah, these are pretty large policies, and I think the insurance companies were sort of wondering, you know, <laughs> what's a doctor up to? He's going to office children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, because of 
Elijah was, my son was three years older than my daughter. His policy, and I put the same amount of money into each of them each year. Uh, his initial policy was about 300000 less than my daughter's. But my daughter's now 18 and my son's 21. And I just checked currently my son's death benefit is one million three hundred seventy-one thousand. My daughter's is one million eight hundred forty-six thousand. They're ca- um, I'm limited now how much I can put into the policies. As a matter of fact, I just paid my daughter's base premium, which is four thousand, and the company actually uh, texts me in the next day or two of how much I can still put to the POA rider, but it's not a lot anymore. But their cash value increases. My daughter's cash value increase this year was twelve thousand. My son's was eleven thousand. And even though my son's death benefit is a lot less than my daughter's, her cash value is ninety nine thousand. My son's is one hundred and two thousand currently. Now, the, what I've done over the years is I gift each child money into their the separate bank accounts and then pay the policy premiums out of those separate bank accounts so they have a basis in their policies. So when I plan, hopefully if I live another 10 to 12 years, I plan on giving the policies to them around age 30. I figure by that time they'll have enough wherewithal that they'll understand the banking. And by that time, my daughters will have pretty close to 300 some thousand in there. My son will have 280 or so. Actually, pretty close to 300. I was sort of surprised seeing that their cash values were equalized, even though their death benefits were so much different. Now, I've also, one of the things that I've sort of put into my trust agreement is that when they get the policies, they need to keep this these policies as personal property if they if and when they get married and that just yeah so there's, there's some ramifications to that you know there is a proper way to gift money even to minors um you know so they do have a basis um and then there are underwriting requirements you know mom and dad have to have x number of dollars and base amount oh, yeah. from all sources you know there's some limits but you know it, it all can be done um yeah we had large policies on my end yeah i mean y'all started correctly you started on yourself several times over then went to the children and then came back and you know their mom and i mean it was just all a good job so if you just extrapolate that out um, you know, or you're, you're talking about long time periods and we may not be here. You know, I love to talk about 50 year timelines, which is kind of a long timeline for a Westerner, you know, in, in Asia, they think generations ahead, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so what, I'm not going to be here. Neither are you, but your people will be. So, you know, why not? I mean, that's, and that's really part of the, a problem, you know, in our thinking, it's like we're just thinking short term. We, we often think short term and then the immediate results. And that has all kinds of consequences. You know, some are not life ending or, you know, a complete train wreck. But the longer I think, the longer term I think, the better I think I can lay the solid foundation. I mean, I truly believe that. But your children, you know, talking about your, you know, winning on cancer now and you hope to live 10 or 12 years and I hope you live much longer than that. But they're going to have a real problem. You know, when you graduate, there's going to be an influx of tax-free money. And that's a whole new problem. Where are they going to put it? You know, um, so leading the way and showing your children and your prodigy uh, this idea and help them embrace this concept. I mean, they should be continuing to buy policies, you know, because now because of the children and that at that time, you're limited to mainly a base premium, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so either they've got to go buy more, poli- they'll have to buy more policies because of the amount of death benefit oh, yeah. you have in force. Um, and my trust is set up that if they have kids, the trust will be, yeah. pay the premiums for their kids. And, right. And then, so they'll be, it'll, it'll pass on generationally for a while. So, I mean, that's pretty powerful. 
Oh, yeah. And, and all I can do is thank Nelson for being there. And like I said, I, I read a lot, and there's a lot of books out there. Well, it looks like we got a whole uh, and, slew of them on the table here. Not all I've, of them, but there's a lot of them. And I've read a lot of books from IUL, UL, uh, Equity Index, Life Insurance, and the big thing that you learn, and I read these books and I see what people do, and it's like everything else. You take the good with the bad. Uh, I can learn from anybody. But what happens is you have dividend-paying whole life insurance to a mutual company, which Nelson considered the best product out there. And then suddenly you've got universal life that has a term component that basically what's happening is the insurance companies is transferring the risk from them to the owner of the policy. And Violating the very nature and the very essence of insurance. That's right. I'm transferring the risk to someone else. And they're universal life. The companies transfer the risk right back to you. And equity index policies are even worse. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Because yeah. they're putting you at risk with the market. And, yeah, it's the ins life insurance companies love it. And then you talk, have people like Ramsey and Orman and some of the others that say, buy term. My parents tried to sell me their, uh, or give me their term policies if I just take over the payments. They were in their 70s. Now, what they didn't realize, my mom died at age 88. My da dad died at 92 or 91 and a half. So if I had taken over their policies, I would have gone broke paying for the premiums for just minimal return so I would have lost money so and that's what Ramsey and Norman don't talk about the ages where you need the life insurance and you have the cash values most people drop their policies between 65 and 70 and suddenly they've got nothing for the kids you've basically destroyed wealth in the family and during this time you connect you can take withdrawals tax-free up to your basis and take policy loans for the rest of your life. I have a friend that who actually works for Lloyd's of London. And when I started this with her, she didn't believe you could do it. Can I say she's an attorney? Yeah, <laughs> she's an attorney. To, and, and it has like 70 or a, a lot of attorneys under her. She's like really yeah. cool and knocking and, it out of the park. And, and she... When she was going to buy an equity index policy, and I said, no, it's going to fall apart with age. So she trusted me enough that she was putting 193000 a year into this policy. You don't have to throw out numbers. But, well, it's, it's – but she has over $2 million in death um, in cash value at this point, and they do real estate projects. She now can fund her own projects. I mean, she doesn't need to go to any bank and – so it's, is she your second client or third no, one? No, no. She was down the road somewhere. <coughs> well, I know. It, well, since we, but yeah. my favorite client is, she again, it's a nurse mm -hmm. who had nothing. And oh, yeah. she was credit card debt of somewhere around fifteen twenty thousand. 20000 She had no 401k, no IRA, nothing set up for retirement. And... All she could do was like $500 a month. And she had a little money that she could dump in on top of it. I just talked to her yesterday, or Wednesday, and she is so excited. She now has 300 some thousand in death benefit. She, the other day, her cash value, she thought she had, you know, two or three thousand she could borrow she called the company and said oh you've got twenty thousand in there you can borrow and she goes what and she, that's very common you well, know yeah. it's like when you when you're committed to pay a premium you know you put your hand to the plow you don't look back and you're going forward and you get past the noise because I, re, I i remember her it, it, when she first became your client i mean it was she was i don't want to say desperate or dire but i mean she she didn't have a clear path. No, you know, she had and, nothing. And now she's got 
she can leave her kids over three hundred thousand, and she, she's still paying her premiums, and she's still borrowing, and but she's paying herself, and she still has some outstanding debt to herself, but she's not paying eighteen and twenty percent to credit cards anymore. Right. I mean that, but that's very common. You know, when you when you when you begin, you know, the premium looks enormous or whatever, um, and and then all the noise is like, oh, you're buying whole loft. That's the worst place in the world to put money. You should do this over here. Whatever it is they're selling, and uh, but if you keep going, you, you look up and it's like, wow, I didn't I didn't realize it. Even though you've seen the illustrations, you had all the conversations about right. that, and then actually seeing your cash values increase on a daily basis and it just happens quicker than most people realize oh, yeah. and if that was last week the death benefits greater today and the cash value is oh, yeah. greater today the thing that i really learned over the last five ten years is the pre the what counts the most is uninterrupted compounding it's the the uninterrupted part that's the most important because it doesn't matter what year you take a loss. Say you invested $100,000 in the stock market, and you know there's going to be a loss somewhere along the line. And these losses are usually 30% or more, or down years. And it doesn't matter what year that loss occurs. The end result is the same in terms of monetary value. That loss you can't replace. And what happens with life insurance is it's the compounding is uninterrupted. Like we talked about before, there's a guaranteed and non-guaranteed side. But once a dividend's been declared and the interest has been added to that, or the cash value increase has been added to it, it goes to the guaranteed side and can never be taken away from you. So that uninterrupted compounding becomes enormous over 20, 30, 40 years. And that's where my kids, I mean, they're 18 and 21. They're only going to be able to pay $4,000 a year into their policy when they're 50 and 60. But their cash value increase each year will be 60, 70, 80,000. What? I mean... They, it's a retirement set up for them, even with inflation, that their their future is taken care of. I like the the fact that you mentioned the dividend, you know, which is declared annually, paid at the end of the policy year, the contract year, and it is not guaranteed. But once it's paid, it is properly structured. It should be that dividend should be directed to be paid into the PUA, the paid up additions rider. And you have several dividend elections. I can take it in cash. Sure. You know, I can leave it at the company to earn interest. Um, I can reduce a loan. I can reduce a premium. There's, you know, five to six different options the policy owner has. The greatest one, in my opinion, is having the dividend paid to the PUA. And once it's paid, it doesn't, it can't go back in value, it can't reduce. Now, and I've talked about this before. If you think, let's 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 all, let's all go shopping um, to uh, Home Depot, right? Um, now, I, I'm i buying their products, right, it, as a consumer. So I exchange the money for the product and I get all the use of the product, whatever it is that I bought. Now, if I were to go buy stock in Home Depot and they pay a dividend, right? And let's say that I put that dividend to a dividend reinvestment program, the drip, right? Well, the stock value goes up and down. So if a dividend bought me one stock, and this is a loose general example, the the price of the, the share of that stock is not stable, nor is it guaranteed, so Unless the, you pay taxes on it. What? <laughs> well, not if I'm in a qualified plan. Oh, yes, uh, you do. What if it's in a Roth IRA? Yeah, yeah. Um, but my point is that that value of that stock oh, yeah. can go up or down. Or go know? away. Right. And then, do I care if you know Home Depot's profitable? Well, sure, I care just enough because I'm going to continue buying products there. Where if I'm borrowing against my cash value, the cash value that I have in my policy by guaranteed contract, and I own a policy with a mutual company, I am an owner of that mutual company. Do I mind paying them interest on a loan? 
go borrow money from Home Depot. Oh, they do have credit cards. What? And what is the rate on the credit card? So I can practice banking with anything, right? Banking is a process. It's a movement of money, you know, deposits, withdrawals, loans, loan repayments. So when we talk about banking, quote unquote banking, we're talking about the movement of money. So I can bank with anything. Yeah, you can put it in a tin can. You can put it under your yeah. mattress. I can bank with cows, tractors, yeah. cars, whatever it is. But, but nothing gives you yeah. the tax-free or tax-deferred. Preferential tax treatment. Or maybe yeah. it's properly taxed, right? Yeah. Because life insurance is a loss. If I graduate, my family loses sure. me and they lose all of my future income. It's like, I, uh, you know, you have an automobile accident. You get a a uh, a check, right, for the loss of that damage, and that check comes quickly. And it's well, but it's tax free if it's yep. an insurance, right? So, yep. um, it's the same with life insurance. So it's really appropriately taxed, in my opinion, because it's sure. a loss. It's not an investment. It's not a gain. It's a replacement of a loss. Therefore, yeah, a it should be taxed. Of, yeah, it's a replacement of right. a life value or income. Yeah. So and just and think about that. Some guy three thousand miles away, i.e., the underwriter, the whole life insurance industry is going to put a value on my human life, human life value, human economic value. It's like whatever. But look, anything you do has rules, right? And the other thing that is so wonderful about these policies, especially um, the ones that I have, is I can borrow the money from the policy. And because I'm borrowing the the money from the company, not for, directly from myself, they treat my money my money, even though I borrowed against it, as if it's still there. So my dividends and interests are still based on whatever cash values I had in there. Oh, you must have non-direct recognition. Yeah, <laughs> non-direct. Does that matter? <laughs> Only if you're banking, quote unquote, right? Oh yeah. If you're not banking, it might not matter. Yeah, I've heard. Some people say it it doesn't matter that much if it's recognized or not recognized, but I'd rather have the not recognized because I know what's going to happen. Yeah, no, we can talk about that. And you know, people do whatever they do, and because um, you hear that all the time. Oh, well, you're just getting lost in the weeds, and no, no, not at all. If uh, we're practicing banking, then there's interest, right? So if there's interest, there's a the cost of that capital on policy loan, right? Well, if you're going to reduce my dividend for that balance that's outstanding, isn't that another form of the cost to oh, capital? Yeah. And it's like, it, it does matter. And I've seen illustrations where, you know, the, they build jank policies with the company A, direct recognition, company B, non-direct recognition. And it's pretty much the guys or the people who think you should own and it doesn't matter, non or direct recognition companies. They're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. So I've seen these illustrations where they'll go out 10 years of premium payments and then start financing. Oh, okay. You know, and it's, you know, it just speaks to uh, uh, illustrations, you know, building illustrations and comparisons, comparisons and this, you know, comparative analysis. Um, They're really just playing games with numbers on a page, in my opinion. It's very simple. Right. And And it doesn't have to be complicated is my point. And like I said, I, I read a lot, and so I, I, I'm probably a little bit further along than most people that are just starting out. But it's well, you should be after twelve years or <laughs> yeah, the, uh, whatever thirteen, yeah, twelve, thirteen years. And I, I I'm going to continue learning because, like I said, it's and writing a book, you actually learn even more, and teaching it, you learn more because people come to at you with all kinds of questions and. And like I said, there's a lot of naysayers out there. And it's funny, I've learned over the years, you can't predict who's going to get it, who's not going to get it. I have people that are financially savvy, that understand finance, that don't get it. And I've got friends that just based on trust, they get it, and 10 years later, eight years later, they're saying, man, I'm so glad I did this. I'm grateful that you taught me this and showed it to me. And like I said, it's it's interesting. Uh, the other um, – I just lost my train of thought. Uh, it happens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It happens. I like that, you know, it's caught more than taught. You know, our friend, you remember Gina Wells? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I spoke at the think tank earlier this year, and you know, and I 
quoted her because I love it. It's in her, she said, um, and her mentor might have shared that with her, you know, and I don't know who he was, but um, or a mentor. But she said, if you have to drag them in, you have to drag them around. You know, it literally is caught more than taught, you know, and you can't, you know, Ben Franklin, you know, convince a man against his will he's of the same opinion still, you know, and, and so, you know, my encouragement for the listener, the viewer is to go to the source. If you want to learn this concept, don't learn it off of YouTube. Don't learn it off of TikTok or any other social media. You know, you can learn about it, but you should go to the source. Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. You know, it's on the bottom of one of these stacks, appropriately so, the foundation. Yeah. right? And then his second book, Building Your Warehouse of Wealth. right? And then a third book here, How Privatized Banking Really Works, Dr. Robert Murphy and Carlos Lara. Um, co-authored that book and, I mean and, and then there's a DVD down there Nelson's six and a half hour video series which is now downloadable you don't have to buy the plastic and stick it in a machine you know um, but a solid foundation a solid foundation is it requires your education so it takes a little time right? and it takes a little money I bet I bet you can buy the foundational material uh, for under $300. I yeah, don't know. Like I said, it's it's a learning process. It's going to take a little time to get it. But you have to trust in the system. And like I said, it's... Like I said, it's not until I fully started understanding how these policies work and taught... And I learned so much in private conversations with Nelson... Because when he wrote his book and we started talking about a policy, he goes, what he wrote is not what he would actually do in terms of the policies become so big that people wouldn't believe the numbers. So he said, I had to scale it down yeah. because the policy that he did shows on his daughter about not going to college and paying her way. It shows what, buying one car a year and, you know, leasing it. She could have easily leased six or seven cars, but the numbers, like I said, get so big that people say, ah, oh, this is bogus. And, yeah. But it's for real. I said, like, my kids, by the time they're in their 50s and 60s, their cash values are going to be so great. My lawyer friend out in California, what she's going to leave her son is in the range of somewhere around 15 million. I mean, it, that's if she graduates sooner than later, she yeah. lives out of her life expectancy. Oh, if, she, if she lives like her mom, her mom's still alive in her nineties. I'm she, glad you brought her mom up, but yeah, I mean, it, it would be more than 15 million, wouldn't it? I, oh, I don't yeah. know. It's but. somewhere in that range and that's tax free to her son. Oh, I mean, that's... Oh. <laughs> wonder what the tax bracket's going to be whenever she graduates. Nah, she's he, still young and healthy, you know? It's James like, just brought up her parents. Her parents had. Well, you brought her up, and I'm oh, glad you did because her mother's. Well, no, you yeah, go her ahead. mother's still alive, but she. They had an equity index second to die policy. Yeah. And her husband died. In a and, second to die, so the death benefit is paid on the death of the second spouse, and then you get some uh, blended underwriting. So one spouse could be less healthy than the other. So you know, there's some arbitrage on health underwriting. But the premium is continued, re it's required. The premium is paid between the first death yeah. all the way into the second death. Then the death benefit is paid out, second to die. Okay. And the policy, the way it was set up, uh, like I said, it's an equity index policy. So there was about 375, 400,000 in cash in the policy still. Account value. And because her age and because of the term component, it showed the, the cash values disappearing in the next five to six years and then the policy lapsing. So, Or the premium. It would, the premium yeah. continued to go up, so it wouldn't carry, quote-unquote, unless the premium was paid a, subs I mean, a, a ridiculous premium. Nobody would write the check no. to pay that premium. So literally, we saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars by, and 
at the time I would have switched her over into an annuity, but they took the cash. So, yeah. but <clears throat> they were going to lose. Still alive. Yeah, yeah, and look, she's still alive in her nineties, and so that would have. Yeah, that they would have lost four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and it would have cannibalized. I want to say that was seven, eight, nine yeah. years ago. That's a long time ago. Now there's some equity index policies that try to get around it now by having a no lapse guarantee, saying that yeah. death benefit. It, they basically become expensive term policies. That's right. Yeah, it's a no lapse guarantee as long as you pay the premium. Yeah. All right. And then in two today, and I don't want to be overly technical, but you know the UL guys or people, they're like, oh no, we'll just lower the death benefit in the future to the corridor, and it won't mac, and and it's like. Man, you're just massaging and manipulating numbers on a page, yep. right? Anything it takes to get that illustration to the point where the consumer says yes, the agent gets paid, and profitable for the life insurance company, profitable for the agent, and out of the three, you know, WC Fields, well, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> well, who's this, who's your schmuck at the table, you know, that's yeah. losing? It's you. It's me. It's us. Yeah, it's, like I said, why would you take, the best product out there, which is a dividend-paying whole life insurance policy from a mutual company, and take on additional risk that you don't need to take. And you don't have to mutilate these illustrations. Um, in, in what I mean by that, you don't have to make, excuse me, a whole life policy, you know, illustrate going cash on cash in years one, two, three, four, five. I mean, the base premium has more power in the future than the PUA. The PUA has more power, quote unquote, air quotes, in the early years. That gives you the early cash value, right? So if we're afraid to pay a premium, i.e. we've got to, you know, collateralize every dollar that we paid in as soon as possible, you're not thinking long-term and you're afraid to capitalize. So the four fundamentals of Nelson Nash, number one, think long-term. All right, you're not thinking long term if you've got to access all that capital right now, right? And you're afraid to pay a premium if you've got to access all that capital right now. Now, I'm not saying that you can't build a properly structured policy and have substantial cash values. You can. I'm talking about the mu mutilated illustrations and policies, right? It's violating the four fundamentals of Nelson. And I, my experience, 90, 90 times out of 100, the people that buy into that, they don't. Need, they're not even honest bankers because they were afraid to capitalize. They're afraid to think long term, and so they're probably not going to be an honest banker. And ultimately, you know, says don't do business with banks as a fourth, other than checking and uh, savings. But then he added the fifth, right? Rethink your thinking. They are still stuck in in traditional investment Wall Street thinking. You know, yeah, there's going to be lots of liquidity for the first. And because of our artificially low interest rates, it's going to be loss of liquidity for the first five, seven, maybe up to 10 years. I mean, but so what? I mean, yeah, and that never takes into account what, what you're actually doing with those cash values, if you're doing anything. And then you don't necessarily have to go, if, look, the, the capital stock of a bank is money. That's right. We're talking about becoming your own banker, quote unquote. You have to be properly capitalized. Nelson even called it the capitalization phase. Yeah, you know, paying premiums where there is a loss of liquidity in the early years. I mean, you you cannot be afraid to capitalize. You cannot be afraid to pay a premium. And and there's no shortcut to that. You no. can do some artificial manipulation on policies, but that's exactly what it is. It's artificial, and it is manipulation. It might solve for early cash values, but what happens is further out, 10 years down the road, 12 years down the road, oh, James, I'm not going to live that long. You don't know what you're going to do in the future. is unknown to all of us. Oh, yeah. So, and, and you're not going to have a lesser need for capital in the future. Have you experienced that in your life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all need capital. We're all going to need capital. So I may not be able to work, and I'm going to have to take out policy loans to pay my salary or my living expenses. So who knows? I mean, it's, like I said, during my cancer treatments, when I went through the chemo and the radiation, I continued working during that entire time, even though it literally busted my butt but the reason i did that was i didn't want to steal from my family yeah so i yes i could have taken out policy loans yes i could have taken it out of my um savings but it would have taken away from my family's future earnings so my my feeling was i 
put up with you know what I put up with and I continue working just so I could keep paying my premiums keep paying the policy um, so there there may be a time where I can't work and that at that time I want to make sure that there's enough money in those policies that they're self-supporting until that time comes so maybe you won't want to work yeah, and maybe you just get bad and quit, you know. And right now, I've, I'm been blessed. Which wouldn't happen with him. I mean, Nelson talks about windfalls. I've got a property that I paid very little into, and it's my reward is in the million. Oh, yeah, it's over a million dollars. I I paid thirty thousand into own part of this property, and my share of the property will be split between me and my wife will be over two million. So it's that will pay down a lot of policy loans. My kids' policies will be completely whole. So when they inherit or get their policies, they'll start it with a clean slate. Their <laughs> school loans will be paid for. Everything will be paid for. So if they want to buy a house, they can pay buy their own house, or they can, and this. This is the only place where I disagree with Nelson at all on it. Uh -oh. David Stearns and some of the others that, you know, you don't want to be part of the problem. Right. But we were in an artificially low interest rate environment where you could borrow from the insurance policies anywhere from 4 to 6% or f depending on the policies. But when you can get money from the bank at, Two percent, two and a half percent. Why not use the policy as collateral to take out a thirty-year, two percent, three percent loan? Now that those days are over. I mean, yeah. six and six point five now. And you know, Nelson and I talked about that many times. You know, and he was so much more. He had so much more grace than I. I mean, that's <laughs> that's becoming a new challenge for me. You know, to be more graceful. Um, and I know my work's cut out for me, but uh, you know if if you're gonna if you'll loan me a million dollars at one or two percent, I know what to do with capital. I will take sure. that loan, right? And I have personally collateralized policies sure. at the bank. And of course, I'm thinking I'm being all benevolent and altruistic. You know, like my uh, original banker graduated several years ago. I've been with him thirty years, a long time. I mean, he actually he was a teller at a bank that my dad banked at 50 years ago, right? So, I mean, mm. I knew the guy. He's a great guy. Um, he wasn't interested in learning anything about infinite banking or life insurance, but he's still a great guy, right? Well, he graduates, and now then I'm an orphan at the bank. And so this young Bobby, who's become a dear friend, um, you know, took us on as, you know, here, these are all orphans. These are your new consumers. And so he calls and introduces himself. And, you know, I, I mean, I love the guy. He's a great guy. And, uh, hey, James, need any money, need any loans? I'm like, eh, not really. Uh, but I did collateralize a policy. Uh, it was a first-year policy with a company that out in the industry said they wouldn't allow first-year loans. And so that's that's no big deal. The banker can do whatever he wants, right? So anyway, I took this policy. It had substantial cash value. I go down to the bank, and I'm like, Bobby, have you ever seen a life insurance policy like this? He's like, no, Mr. Nether, I haven't. Are you interested in learning or seeing it? He's like, well, yeah, maybe. I said, well, I'm going to collateralize it for a loan. And he's like, yeah, I'm very interested in learning. And so there was an educational process there, right? So I think I'm cutting, you know, a fat hog. I'm doing two or three things at once. Of course, I'm being benevolent, right? And I'm going to create this big presentation, and uh, so I did that, you know, I showed him and, and, and the, the point behind that was, look, Bobby, there's a lot of companies out here that have really high uh, dividends, but they reduce the dividends if they're outstanding loans. And these companies that go unnamed um, have trained their agents for years to have a relationship with a banker. You know, here, you take your customers, your client's policy, show them how to take it down to the bank. They get a full dividend. They pay a lesser loan rate on the loan. And so you have this relationship between the, the agent, their client, and the banker, right? So I think I'm being benevolent, you know, showing Bobby that, you know, you can probably go get a lot of new loans and clients if you, you know, go to these companies and, you know, become familiar with some of their producers and, and you know, you can get some policy loans. Um, and, of course, I said in any, if any of them, you know, uh, 
fail to perform, I'm a buyer of those policies, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the company wouldn't do first year loans, quote unquote. So I took the policy down to the bank, collateralized it. You know, like I said, I think I'm being benevolent and altruistic. Show Bobby how they work. You know, I got a loan. I think we built a pool. I can't remember. We did something. I think it was a pool. It was a pool, right. And then in the conversation, you know, I had a conversation with Nelson through all of this, right? And uh, it, it, because before that, I'm like, you know what I should do is, uh, I'm talking to Nelson, I'm like, we're going to build a pool because we're going to move. But before we move, we want to buy the right thing, but we want to be happy where we're at. We were there 17 years or whatever and built a pool, you know, and then remodeled the house and, you know, to get it in preparation to sell when we buy another one. Um, so I'm telling Nelson, you know, and I had done some, we had done some uh, cash out refis, right? I so said, I think I'm going to do another cash out refi, buy a life insurance policy or pay to the PUA, and then finance the pool from there. And I'm telling Nelson this the whole time. What do you think about that? He goes, oh, well, you know, that, yeah, that'd be good, James, you know, to be able to show people what you can do. The banker can do anything they want. And, you know, he's being so gracious, right? And, and of course, the interest rates. And I know were, what he's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. And then, and then I wound up doing that, and I took all that through Nelson, and, you know, and just so gracious. Uh, anyway, uh, so I did that, you know, had that experience and could talk about it and do a presentation on it and all that. But at the end of the day, why would I ever take one of the most valuable assets that I own and put it in the control of someone else? And, and, and at the time, you know, I could, you know, have – we had multiple policies and at that time we did too, you know, I, I didn't have to borrow the money from the bank. I didn't have to collateralize that policy. You know, we could have built the pool. But why uh, not take cheap money? And that's yeah, the one place where I disagreed with Nelson was, and he would say, you've become part of the problem. Yeah. Because that money didn't exist on that loan until you signed your John Henry. So that was your contribution to the inflationary environment. Yeah. So it's, it's, and I, re I've wrestled with that, but like I said, if somebody's willing to give me a 30 year loan at two or 3%, even 4%, and I can borrow from my policy at four to 5%, why wouldn't I do that? I mean, because, and these are loans, anybody that's got a 30-year, 2 3 4% loan right now, never pay it off. Because, especially if you've got the assets in your life insurance that you could pay it off if you had to, because interest rates are never going to be this low again. I mean, we've, we've hit an inflationary period right now that... We're back in the early 80s, the Carter years. We're going to see stagflation. We're going to see incredibly high interest rates. Housing is going to be affected because people won't be able to get house loans. So, like I said, if I if somebody's willing to give me money at 2 or 3% and even at 4% for 30 years, I'm not going to be here in 30 years. I can, I can I, you know, I don't disagree. I mean, I think every case is individual. Yeah, and I can make an argument on both sides of that. But if you lent me money at 1% or 2%, see, you wouldn't be adding to the inflationary environment. Yeah. Because you had to exchange your God-given abilities, talents, and time, and, you know, uh, to or to earn that capital to be in a position to loan the money. But, but I'm not going to loan money at 1% or 2%. <laughs> I bet you won't. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. yeah, of course. But no. you can make a case either way. Yeah. If you look at it, look, if I have a 30-year mortgage, 25 years from now, my $1,000 a month mortgage is going to be the equivalent of paying $300, oh, if yeah. that. You know, so I'm paying with depreciating dollars, and I'm purchasing an appreciating yeah. asset, right? And it's the real estate that appreciates, not the equity. So, I mean, we can go way deep into all that. Oh, but yeah. at the end of the day, some people are risk adverse. That's why they do that. You know, some people um, won't operate any other way other than leverage, you know, so we're all different. Yeah, we've um, talked about that before is equity in a property or equity in anything makes zero percent interest. And there's a gatekeeper between you and yeah. your equity. Your equity. So, right. like I said, it's that's why, especially with low interest rates, I'm in no hurry to pay off any loan. I ask uh, quite often, um, 
is it better to pay something off or is it better to have the ability to pay something the off? The ability always trumps. It's control. That's absolutely correct. Right. Because what people don't realize, especially if they follow some of these gurus that say, you can pay your house off, your 30-year mortgage off in 15 years or even mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. But what they don't tell you is, and I deal with this because I deal with a senior population, is if you end up in a nursing home and you don't have the cash, they do what's called Medicare or Medicaid spin down. Medicaid. Where they literally strip all your assets. I mean, literally, you end up losing everything just to pay your nursing home bills. So I'd rather have money in my life insurance policy and very little equity in my house because if something bad's going to happen and you couldn't pay the bank, whose house are they going to foreclose on first? The person with a lot of equity or the person with no equity? They're going to foreclose on the house of the equity. Yeah, be there 25 years and run into trouble, right? All that yeah. equity's there. You're separated by the gatekeeper. Um, you, you lose your job or whatever. You know, can you afford to make that house payment? I hope so. You're probably not going to get to the equity through a loan, right? No. But yeah. if you bring up Medicaid too, and we're not talking, we're not giving Medicaid yeah. advice or do Medicaid planning. You know, I personally, we have relationships with um, board certified elder law attorneys. Those are proper professionals who properly practice Medicaid planning. Um, but these life insurance policies, you know, most of them have riders that you know, or chronic illness or specified disease, you know, or nursing home, long-term care riders, not all of them, but, you know, the ones that do, or the ones that, that do have those available, you know, that's probably something that you and your uh, educated advisor and agent should, you know, talk about. Because Also, it falls outside of the purview of them being able to take them away from you. Not with Medicaid. No way. No, there's a limit on how much cash value oh, there's, yeah, you can have in life insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a countable asset when it comes to Medicaid. Um, and then and then if, if, I, if I have to have long-term care, it, I'm going to either pay for it with cash, capital I have today, or there's going to be a long-term care policy in place or a combination of those until I'm out of money, and then I'm, I'm at the behest of the state. Medicaid is a joint uh, work and, and program joint between the state and federal. Um, but in, in, in every state, similar but a little bit different. But, you know, we're in Texas, so if I have a home, right – it's paid for or not paid for. Maybe I have a reverse mortgage on or whatever the situation is. To the extent in which Medicaid paid a benefit, then they can recover that. Yeah. And the recovery is through the probate process, right? I mean, the recovery of the house. Any uh, house currently, you know, and of course it's government stuff, so those thresholds and numbers change all the time. But today, my understanding is if you have a home that's valued over 100 grand, what home is not valued over a hundred grand today, right? In this artificially, you know, uh, low interest rate environment that caused asset prices to go up. So anything above a hundred thousand is attachable, recoverable by the state through the Medicaid recovery process. So, yeah, I've just uh, watched too many people lose their properties. Absolutely, it's it's sad to watch that because I deal with the nursing home population and yeah. it's. And, and just the cost of nursing home today, the oh. cost of Western medicine is ridiculous. Yeah, nursing oh. home, you you can expect to pay at least $10,000 a month. What? I mean, people don't realize you can go through a lot of cash in a hurry. You're burning cash at $10,000 a month. And then before you ever get to the nursing home, you know, I mean, we're in Texas, you know, and there's zones across the country that, uh, that uh, the cost of different care, but Medic Medicare or health care long-term care and even nursing home care the the zone that we're in with nursing home care not nursing home but uh home health care is is we're in the high zone in texas right now you can spend a lot of money you can burn a lot of money eight to twelve thousand dollars a month before you ever get to the nursing home oh yeah and the, talking you know i've been going through chemo and radiation and there's all these advantage plans out there. Again, you're talking, and this, it's very similar to life insurance, is 
how can an advantage plan offer you something more than Medicare, straightforward Medicare plus the supplements? It's not possible. And what I'm watching in nursing homes is suddenly people are getting kicked out of nursing homes because their advantage plan only allows them to be in the nursing home so long. I can tell you from my experience going through chemo and radiation and having straightforward Medicare plus straightforward supplementals and Part B, Part D and G and A, B, C, D, <laughs> yeah, all the yeah. alphabet soup. My medical bills right now would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I can tell you literally, since I've been on Medicare, I paid literally zero out of pocket or very little out of pocket. So I tell people all the time, stay away from the Advantage plans. Uh, uh, the, the, there is no real coverage under Medicare for nursing home. Oh, There's, okay. you know... Uh, intermediate custodial and uh, what's the other skilled nursing yes. coverage under Medicare and it's very limited it is not designed to pay for you know long term care um, hence the reason you know they pay 100% for so many days partial copay and then lesser of a copay and then when you're done you're done yep you know out on the street <laughs> yeah and then you're done and if you I mean you must be working with bougie bougie uh, nursing home facilities because they're if they're kicked out they're and under Medicaid they're more than likely going to a lesser expensive oh, yeah. you know, they, facility they're going to they probably some, don't not yeah. not some place you'd want to be they probably don't have board certified general surgeons <laughs> associate I don't know you know I'm just saying and uh, but that's that's off the subject that's not life insurance no but uh well, look, you got a lot of books here. Let's, yeah, you know, let's, well, wait, before, you know, I have a lovely listener that uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, she asked me, we were talking about the podcast and she asked me or she suggested, um, and so you're going to be a, you're going to be an easy one here, right? She said, well, James, why don't you, um, a good question may be for your guest, um, you know, who's been most influential in your life? And you don't have to narrow it down to one person, but who's who's really influenced Deb Samlowski in your life? A positive or negative, but, you know, preferably positive. Well, I've got a lot of negative influences, <laughs> including some very famous surgeons uh, oh. that I've try to destroy each other's careers. Oh. Uh, but Nelson's got to be at the top of the list. I mean, my parents obviously are up there. Because my dad was always overinsured, or what he considered overinsured. He always believed in having disability insurance and having in life insurance, uh, even though they had a bunch of term policies. Um, then I have some family friends that I wish I'd learned more from. I mean, people... That person I was talking about with the equity index policy, the second to die policy, he had an eighth grade education, but he became a construction. You talking about Dvorkin? company? No, about uh, the other one. The other one. Okay. He literally went from nothing to owning millions of dollars of properties. Okay. Another one that influenced me was a guy that my dad used to go to all the Olympics to and he didn't have the money to go to college and a pharmacist paid his way through college in return that he'd work for him and they started buying real estate together and the properties kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and by the time he died he'd given Ohio State the largest gift in the history of the college wow and he he was he was the first person I ever knew that I learned that you could own a skyscraper. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, You're and what? One, one of my regrets is that I didn't spend my summers learning from him. Mm. But I, I didn't know at the time. My parents were sort of like the Robert Kiyosaki parents, rich dad, poor dad. My parents 
even though they weren't poor, they stressed education, a good, ed, you know, being a doctor, and they were less interested in the entrepreneurial side. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, it's, I left that out. I was just thinking that. Yeah, I mean, you're an entrepreneur among entrepreneurs. So, to me, if it cash flows, I'm interested. <laughs> I mean, it's so yeah. But Nelson uh, is, is got to be ranked way up there because he's changed my life so drastically. Like I said, I read a lot, and I tell people all the time, and the book I'm writing, and unfortunately there's so many people out there that now don't give Nelson credit for what he came up with. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, read Become Your Own Banker first, then Warehouse of Wealth, read Carlos Lara and Robert Murphy's book. But don't leave out some of the other books, but you have to read them with a jaundiced eye or you have to look at them with the eyes saying... What a medical term, a jaundiced yeah. eye. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at it from the standpoint that... Because I can, like I said, I can learn from anybody, good and bad. And I can learn, see what the people with equity index funds were doing. I can see what... There's a book out that I don't recommend. It's called Tax-Free Retirement. <clears throat> <clears throat> He's written two books since then. Patrick yeah, and Kelly. it's unfor yeah, I've I've got those two, but it's Did you read them? Yeah. yeah. I and didn't read the third one. He there's he uses universal life, which is gonna fall apart. It's not gonna perform. But the concepts, some of the stuff I learned from him, I can like I said, I can learn from anybody. I have a friend you know, before you move on from Patrick Kelly, you know, I met him one time at an insurance conference way back in the day, and I had been practicing the infinite banking concept for a year or two, of course, where we were going. He was part of the speaking thing, you know, and and uh, and I'd already read his book, and I just asked him, um, and he, I'm sure he doesn't remember me. He's, you know, a paid speaker within the insurance industry, or was at the time, and no disparagement to the man. He's just got the wrong product. So um, I asked him if he knew, you know, have you ever heard of the infinite banking concept or anything about banking? And it was just like, a deer in the headlights look but i i got i felt ridiculed you know because i'm bringing a book in an insurance industry conference and a lot of different speakers and they all have their books and i'm sure you know everybody's getting paid or whatever but it's like i'm ostracized because i bring a book you know i mean I, it was kind of awkward sure you know but i mean i bought his books and i use them you know and then one them, of the books but. that i like and I know we disagree a little bit on it. Yeah. I always like Dan Thompson's The Banking Effect. It's funny how that book is the same color and the same size of Becoming Your Own Banker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's uh, one of the stories I like the best uh, is about the guys that go out to the restaurant mm -hmm. and who's paying for it. And mm -hmm. it's about society today. There's some, there's some interesting stories in there. Sure, sure. So, and I agree. Look, my daddy taught me, look, you can learn, everybody can teach you something. Some will teach you what to do, and some will teach you what not to do. So. And then, you know, then there's Dwayne Burnell. Yep. They're, they're decent books. I didn't get as much out of them as I, I like got out of some he's of the others. Friend, the but he, he's a nice guy. He's, and there's other people that have stolen stuff from him. So, but, oh, let's look. Barry Dock's books over here, How Privatized Banking Really Works. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. The Pirates of Manhattan. Yeah. Um, that was then, stolen. <laughs> yeah, and then, no, and Guaranteed Income. Guaranteed Income was just dang near page for page plagiarized. You know, it's like, but what's new in the, yeah. in the world? So, like I said, there's other books. George Antone's book, The Banker's Code. Um. I like Carlos uh, Nelson Nash and Carlos Lara Murphy's book, The Case for IBC. Is that the first edition or the second edition? Uh, that's the first edition. Oh, that's the second edition. Yeah. And then um, I, have a, I have the first edition, too. Then one of my friends, he lives in Austin, Texas. He, um, he wrote a book, Why Doctors Don't Get Rich. Now, it's not doesn't have to do with IBC, but it talks about real estate and he's an orthopedic surgeon. He plays tennis with um, 
Um, eh, just blanked. Uh, Richard Branson on his private island. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so and he's been invited to go to space. So it's... It, it, I hang around some very interesting people. I mean, like I said, last weekend I spent with Dennis Waitley at his compound in California. And Dennis is 89 years old, dealing with cancer. But he, he's still sharp as a tech. And he's like, he and Nelson would become best friends. I mean, he gets privatized banking. He gets the infinite banking concept. Now, at 89, he's not buying policies on himself, and his kids are old, older, too. So, But he gets the concept of why you need to protect your family. Yeah. And then I wrote a chapter in a book called Bringing Value, Solving Problems, Leaving a Legacy. And I told James, anybody that wants a copy – can get it through James as long as they pay the shipping and handling. Uh, I'm, I basically give those away for free. My chapter is second to last. Why ain't right your picture on the front? You would have had hair. That's that's uh, not my personal copies. Oh. I, I've got copies I got with my picture on it. But they they give different co uh, covers for different authors. Oh, I got it. Eb and I went kind of long, so we're going to make a two-part series out of this. So this will be the ending of part one, and we'll pick it up in part two. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.